And now, get ready. We play the games we win. Welcome to Cat Span with your host, Cat Beach, and co host, Nikki Henning. It's just another day in the journey, so grab a drink, a bite to eat, and hang with them for a while as they walk down memory lane. We play the games we win. Hey, hey, everybody. Sorry, we're just a little bit late, just a little bit, but if anybody knows me, <laughs> I'm never late, really, seriously. Nobody uh, <laughs> knows me, for once, this wasn't my fault. Hey, <laughs> raise the roof. <laughs> hey, I'm Kat Beach. I'm Nikki Henney. And we're here today just to share some of our friends. Actually, I'm really excited. Cat Span is going to be months and months of bringing a whole bunch of my my life and my, my journeys and my careers. It's uh, humorous to say that. And, and Nikki was oh, yes. fun, fun. <laughs> but I've had a lot of, of, of pieces and parts to my career over the last um, couple of years. Uh, actually the last couple of decades. I know uh, in all seriousness, I've, I've had a wonderful journey in health and wellness. I've had a wonderful journey um, in broadcast. I worked for Fox at one point. Um, uh, on many occasions, I have done different videos. I am a professional vocalist here in Nashville, Tennessee. And so my journey through voiceover work, my journey, uh, so much of it, I've got, it's just rich with a whole bunch of people. And I didn't want it to be about me. I wanted it to be about my friends and the people I've met over my experience. So uh, number one, Nikki is one of my dearest friends here in Nashville. And we always cut up and have a good time. And that's why we decided to do the show. <laughs> Every time we get together, it's a party. It is a party. <laughs> uh, making fun of that. <laughs> For the most part. <laughs> I'm ashamed of my game. Uh, but, so here we are today with somebody very, very special to me, and we date back to Miami. Um, this was during a period of my life when I was a voiceover artist, and so blessed after I worked for uh, Fox in Miami. Uh, I was doing a little bit of voiceover work, and uh, Tom, I think Tom found my voiceover work, or I'm not sure how it all happened, Mr. Tom Vernon, but I'm, I'm going to introduce you, and, and I will tell you how we met afterwards. Ladies and gentlemen, my dear friend Tom Vernon, who is a professional voiceover artist for a lot of years, extraordinary man, and I love him dearly. You can introduce yourself a little better, Vernon. <laughs> Well, bless your heart, my goodness. I don't even know <laughs> where to begin. I should be bowing down to you, my dear. <laughs> you are just simply amazing. And, I, and I, I have to preface all of this by making it public that I, I just can't thank you enough for even allowing me to be on your show like this, the very first guest. I'm honored to be a guest on your show. And, uh, you know, ever since you and I have met, it's just been an amazing journey between the two of us. But it really is a pleasure and an honor to participate in this. And I know that you're just dying to get into the questions and start asking me things. But uh, <laughs> <laughs> shut up, Tom. We got to move on. <laughs> no, 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 no. So I will say this. Right? Yeah. I'll try to sit in my seat and, and bring my broadcast back. Because, you know me, I always jump around. So it's like, get, get, get it together. together. Okay. <laughs> so when I was at Fox, yeah. I'm going to give you the reality of the moment. And I probably shouldn't say this on, on air, but I was doing some voiceovers for Fox and I ducked into the other room when I saw that American Impact Media was looking for um, voiceover artists. And at Fox is when I sent you my voiceover reel. And so that is how, by the way, ladies and gentlemen, Vernon and I met Tom Vernon. I call him Vernon affectionately. And um, from that point on, Tom, I learned so much from you. It was a, it's a boilerplate and we're going to get into this in a moment, but it's a boilerplate to, to be in the voiceover world. Um, what many of you hear on radio. For those of us who don't know, what is a boilerplate? A boilerplate, that boiler, like this constant, like you're rolling with so many different scripts. I mean, oh. you get like a, a thing about that, that high oh, scripts wow. a day. Uh, and you have to have them done that high, that high scripts mm -hmm. have to have them done. And some of the scripts are like four or five pages oh my. and it's read, uh, it's edited music back and out the door to play back. So, um, I thought this was going to be a really wonderful experience and it was But the best part of the experience 
was learning from you, Tom. And so, so to, to start off the whole experience, I want to say thank you because you taught me a whole lot. There was a huge amount of discipline associated with it. Um, huge amount of stay in the game, even when you're frustrated and things were kind of falling apart and, and, you know, day, day in, day out, you would have people come in and come out. I'm going to and tell you to change your voice or make it higher or lower or so on and so forth, but I'm going to toss off to you. And before we get, you know, I'll, I'll get ahead of myself, but how did you get into voiceover work? Uh, well, <laughs> that's kind of a long and a short story. I mean, uh, to just jump in and say, how'd I get into voiceover? We have to really go back to my career, uh, in radio, because even when I started in radio, I wasn't really doing voiceover work, at least not, uh, at an early start in my career. Uh, and I'll get to how I started and how it all came to me in just a minute. But, uh, to cut to the chase, to move forward, I didn't really start doing voiceover work till I moved here really to South Florida, to Miami and Fort Lauderdale. I was not really doing uh, a lot of stuff up in Cleveland. I did work at the public broadcasting station, uh, Channel 25 up there, uh, WVIZ. I did do the announcer booth there, for like we have here in Miami at Channel 2. I did that for a short stint. But while I was on radio at G98 and a few other radio stations in Cleveland, uh, I was mostly the DJ on the air. So when I moved here in 75 and I started in radio, that's when I really started doing commercials at the radio station. And then people liked my voice and they wanted to use me on something else and before I knew it uh, I was submitting demo tapes to all the agencies uh, and uh, recording studios around South Florida here in Miami Fort Lauderdale and that's how that all picked up but yeah it didn't really start till I moved here to South Florida in 1975 and by that time I was probably already maybe in my late 20s by the time I did that but I actually started in Cleveland much earlier than that uh, as a teenager Wow. wow yeah, my actually, if you want, oh, go ahead, go ahead. Hop back into to, to the radio world. You know, I should I should have topped with that because truth be told, the whole forefront of your life was radio. Correct. Um, t tell everybody how that works. Everybody hears radio, right? Right. <laughs> you're in your car, you're listening to it. You hear somebody speak, you hear uh, a song, somebody speak, and then a, a, a commercial. Yes. Mm -hmm. Tell us how that happens. I think people would be interested to know how that happens behind the scenes on a computer and so on and so forth. Yeah. Well, the thing about it is you have to remember when I got into radio, we didn't have computers. Computers, were, nobody even heard of a computer, you know. Oh, wow. It was real to real. Well, real to reels, but, you know, even, uh, you know, in the early days before cart machines where things were on carts that would plug into a cartridge wow. machine into the studio. Yeah, a lot of that, like you said, was real to real and you just roll it like we have back here. The old Atari 5050s. I don't know if you can see this or not. Oh, you still have that. <laughs> yeah. We have a reel to reel, but we don't use it. It's more or less like a, a relic that we uh, remind ourselves of what the technology was like. And then I would well, tell the audience what it tell tell the audience. I remember because in broadcast school, I had to learn how to put the re like when you did you had to splice it together with tape. It was ridiculous. Mm -hmm. Tell them mm -hmm. tell tell them the audience how that really how that works. That's cool. Yeah, this is called a splicing block here. And I don't know if I, I guess I can't zoom in with this connection that we have to zoom in on it, but uh, unless I take the camera off the thing. But this is, a, <laughs> this is a little track right here that this tape would actually go in this track like this. Oh, yeah. Okay. Yeah, and then the track would go like this. In, in, I mean, the tape would go in there like that. And then you got your razor blade, okay? And then you cut the tape on the angle there where there's a little cut there. You cut the tape and then you use a special kind of tape after you made your uh, your edit then you splice it back together and then you put that piece of that tape over there and you know paste it back together again that's how it was originally done back in the that's early hard. days i've got to stop you here for this moment that is hardcore work because when you do the whole show uh, back in the day in reel to reel they literally had to do the entire uh, uh whether it's a um the show the actual commercials mm -hmm. splice them together literally butt to butt on the tape of what if, if anybody remembers um and i wish i had a tape in, in here right now because <laughs> i have one a cassette tape it's that same type of oh, material nice. and you had right. to tape it together to another commercial and to it was really that was it was tough yeah so, well you're saying you you created a whole block of radio time on these reels by making them 
cut and go together just by and produce the whole thing without yeah without without what without we have now which is which is this wonderful little mouse that does all the work now and and, and, wow. and yes no this was this was hard for it was tough well <laughs> yeah as a matter of fact this may come as a surprise to you cat this may come as a surprise to you, but when you, and, and I can't believe it, I'm sitting right here, okay, in, in master control room A, and, and I look over here and go, you know what? Yeah, you were right there on the other side of that wall, remember? <laughs> yes, I was. You were right there. I'll right insane. there. <laughs> I can't wait to share some of the stories with this audience. Oh, my God. We better be careful. <laughs> <laughs> we have to be a little discreet. When you're in a room with a whole bunch of carpets on the wall and you're saying, thank you for calling me. I trust me. <laughs> yeah. But let me just clue you in. This is not soundproof here. Most studios are soundproof. This is sound absorbing, but it's not soundproof. Not here. Yeah, not here. I would have to attest to that. Yes, you're correct. <laughs> yeah. But, uh, but, but, but this is going to come as a surprise to you, but this is going to come as a surprise to you though, that when you worked here, okay, you had it pretty easy because we had different machinery there that you could kind of just boom, 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 and knock it out. And I think that, well, we had the computer by the time you got here, we were using computers, but before you, yeah, but before you came here, we had to do it reel to reel and you know, everything, even our voices, your voice, my voice, all the voices had to be cut, literally spliced and then edited with the changes in it from these scripts. We had to actually cut the tape, splice the change in, redo it, re-roll it, put it on a cassette and then give it to the playback department. And yeah. We, mm -hmm. And for everybody who is, is listening, it, it, we did a, a lot of on hold messaging. So everything that you hear from, gosh, down in the islands to New York and Canada and above, we've been on a lot and um, <laughs> but send it into playback and mm -hmm. playback would come back on many occasions and say, uh, in my case, because I have a very deep um, um, alto voice, they'd mm -hmm. say, um, this is the first time they said this, mm -hmm. could, could, uh, oh, I got you, Tom. Um, they said, could they make her sound, uh, could, could she sound a little more like a woman? <laughs> <laughs> when that happened the first time, do you remember, Vernon? I walked into your studio. I'm like, they think I sound like the band. Yeah. Here's the illustrious Cat Beach, and uh, you know they say, well, can she sound a little bit more like a, a woman? <laughs> oh, I, I am a woman. So I like up here my nose. And yeah. Else, you have to go in the nose. You kind of do like that. Well, just bring yeah. It. And you want to and you want to know the truth. When I was growing up, before I even got into radio, I used to sing soprano. My voice was real, real high up. Yes, I sang soprano. I was higher. I could sing higher than you can back in the early days. Go on with the bad self. Okay. Yeah. Hey, right. listen, Vernon. We have. <laughs> <laughs> The show has gone off the wall. <laughs> Tom is now a, a soprano vocalist and he's going to sing some classical for us. Tom, and then I can come back and say, tonight on CBS. <laughs> that's, that's ridiculous, right? <laughs> Tom Schaefer, do we have a, a question? Well, you have a couple things. You've got a couple of people in the chat room. Uh, Tony Crabtree says hello to Tom. She says, Hey, Tony. Hey. <laughs> and she says, what a fantastic surprise to see all you talented, beautiful people. Bets Wilson is there. She's excited. And she has a question for you, Tom. Uh, you're the lucky winner of a question. Oh, yes. She says, Hey, Tom, can anyone get into voiceover work without a lot of experience? I mean, for a guy like you, it would be a natural thing. And then she put a kind of a happy ha ha. But she's kind of asking what are some of the, uh, what do we call prerequisites or what would be the, the entry point for getting uh, into voiceover? That would be my question, too. Yeah, uh, that's kind of a tough question to ask because there are many dynamics involved because, uh, are we still on? I see the thing is, I don't see anything yeah, on the yeah, screen. He's, 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 yeah, he's still there. Oh, okay. I saw the screen go blank. Um, yeah, I mean, as far as voiceover, look, I didn't have any experience. I was just a radio DJ. Uh, basically in my radio days. And as I said, uh, I went in recording studios and then just read copy. And I, I read it in, 
in my own delivery. Look, when I was a young kid, I wanted to go to the Columbia School of Broadcasting. I never went to broadcast school. I learned it just by by going into a radio station. If you want me to back up and tell that quick story about how I really got into it, you know, uh, at, and I have some pictures, too, of, of me at that age when I was uh, like six or seven years old. And I'm thinking of, yeah, I have them and I can show you. <laughs> <laughs> Wait, I was I was going 20, 20, six or seven. Uh, I don't know if I can share my screen with you guys, but I I saved some pictures in case you wanted to see them, and we could put them on. Uh, and I remember, the, I remember this, Vernon. Uh, tell them about voice one, two, three, and those things too. Well, yeah, yeah, we'll yeah, 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 we'll get to that. But see, we didn't have any of that before. So to answer uh, Beth's question uh, directly, uh, in today's uh, way of approaching it, it's it's a lot different uh, than it was back then because. Uh, of course, they ask for demo tape, so you have to have a, a, you know at least a little previous experience. Well, your question is, well, how you can get the experience if you don't get the gig? You, know, you got to at least have something. Well, how can I get the gig if I don't have experience? You know, it's a it's a you know a round robin kind of thing. So you know, you just have to uh, if you think you've got the voice for it, then the, the training is what's really important because it's not just reading a piece of copy off a piece of paper. You have to be able to interpret that copy. So if it's a serious read, you have to move your voice down. You have to get emotional. If it's more upbeat like that, well, then you can kind of lift your voice up, you know. Or if you want to do crazy character voices like that once in a while, you can do that too. But, <laughs> but, but, it, but, it, <laughs> but it depends on the type of, of voiceover work that you're looking at. But today, uh, they don't really take demo tapes. Uh, you mentioned Voices.com and Voice123, the online services. Uh, these are probably what the newbies would probably gr uh, gravitate toward if they've never had any experience, but maybe want to upload an MP3 and maybe try it out and see if, if, the, if the audition, you know, uh, if somebody likes their audition, if that answers their question, I don't know. Actually, you know what, Tom, I think that uh, I did in the studio, maybe about 20 different auditions. And what I did is I, and for, for bets and people listening, I did the auditions, but I saved them and I use those as my demo reel because when you do the audition, you have to actually record that, that what they'll do is they'll, you dial into, you know, voice one, two, three, and they'll give you the script or what they call a side and you read it. And I don't think, I think they were all, um, just dry. We didn't put them, did we put music backs to them or just, I think they were just, just a dry Voice are you ta are you talking about the things that you did personally, yeah. or are you talking about the stuff we did here uh, at AIM? No, no personal things on on the ones that vo vo voice one two three. I think we they they asked only for the the just the voice read. So for people who are looking to get oh, into yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. can do the audition, and they'll like you know for so many yeah. different, there are thousands, hundreds of thousands of different ones. You can go in. They'll they'll give you the side. Mm -hmm. You read it and you you record it and send it in. Yeah, and a little trick and a little tip uh, for anybody that's uh, wanting to do that. I learned my own lesson, and I've been doing this for, what, 60 years, and I didn't know this. But uh, if you submit anything, at, le at least to Voices.com, uh, I'm not using 123 anymore. Uh, there were a lot of big questions raised with a lot of these online uh, voice hiring places. And the reason why is because there was a big uproar about why certain people were getting more work than others. And what it is, Kat, is that this is all based on what's uh, like an algorithm. And if the algorithm shows that you're qualified to fit a certain genre or style, then that number will come up in a list like, okay, 10% qualified, 80% qualified. And by the time all is said and done and the smoke is clear, you're not really going to benefit from anything that really the, the algorithm says you, you're not really good at doing because, you know, they're looking for something else. So that's one thing. And the oh, second wow. thing to answer your question is, no, don't put music behind the audition just do a dry voice only i put music on it because i wanted to show them not only that i could produce it but i wanted to show them that i had the ability to take my voice and match it with the 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 uh, uh the feeling of the music but i didn't know what music they're going to use right so that's really an unfair test hadn't even thought about that and by the way and you would tell me i learned this from tom vernon this is actually really important um Many people think that if they don't have, I, I have a very, I have what they would call a news voice because I have that deep, have deep, deep voice. Uh, dark voice. And so that's what, that's why I did Fox and many other things, but I do. Yes. <laughs> I have a male news voice. 
You're the male? Oh. Well, then I must be the female then. I, oh. right. Hi, I'm Ken. No, okay. <laughs> so, um, wait, now you've got me all fine. Listen, forget that. There are lots of different voices. There are Southern voices. There are, there, and, and, this, and I had learned this in Voice Over World. Um, there are lots of different versions of Southern voices that people really want. You don't even realize it. You may say, oh my gosh, I have too much of a Southern drawl. Well, that's a high price ticket. People like that Southern drawl when you're, when you're uh, in the Southern states that sells well. Uh, if you have a voice that has a, um, uh, a Caribbean sound, that sells well. If you have a, a Latin American voice, it sells well. You have no idea how many different vocal types um, uh, international phonics alphabet is what a lot of classical theater uh, performers learn mm -hmm. to change, and Tom knows about this, to change their vocal pattern. So if I wanted to sound Irish, uh, if I wanted to sound African-American, if I wanted to sound um, German, there it, it's a different phonetic alphabet that we learn mm -hmm. uh, in order to do that. But my heavens, there, there are some voices that people pay big bucks for. And, and so that's for a lot of people to know that they can get into it. The British accent happens to be one of the top sellers. Oh, my God. Yeah. And it's funny that you touch on the subject because I was at Tony's house. Tony Crabtree, by the way, I can't wait for you to get her on your show. She's just All amazing. Right. Oh, I mean, if you, I mean, you know, interviewing Tony Crabtree, you're going to need four shows just for the first part of her life. <laughs> She has done so much uh, work in broadcasting and theater and film and television. But as far as voiceover, I was at her house the other night and we were looking at voices.com and there were all the auditions coming in. But yeah, you're right there. They have, well, they wanted an East Indian voice from India. They wanted some uh, Ethiopian thing. They wanted a yeah. Japanese stuff. And, you know, she doesn't do dialects. And that's something that I really don't do well. I don't do dialects. And I wish I could because you're right. If I could do dialects, I could do a lot more British or English. So they hire people from Britain or Ireland to do those things. And we have another question coming in. No, we don't. Nope. Oh, I thought I did. Tom, oh, Tom came in. I was like, okay, I see Tom. Yeah. And, by, and by the way, for the benefit of the listeners out there who may not be familiar with this technology that we used to work with, this is actually what's called a cassette. <laughs> you know, Tom Vernon, tell the audience a little bit about how the animated movies happen. Because I, I think a lot of people listen to them and they watch them and they they don't realize kind of the really the talent behind it because it's detached from yeah well i'll be perfectly honest with you uh, i've done a limited amount of that but uh what a little bit of experience that i've had uh doing it in a studio it is much like uh recording in any recording studio uh, if you're doing a, a national spot in this case it's cartoons or a game thing for a game machine uh, or a cartoon that's going to run on tv i mean basically you've got the video rolling there and then when that part comes up the where you're going to say that line uh they just punch in and then you say your line then they punch out so you're in the studio and you're watching this thing on the screen the animation and then when the thing comes in he says well i told you not to do that come on let's go you know and you just do your thing okay <laughs> you just do your thing and then everything stops and then they say okay let's listen back to that and then they roll it see if it matches up and then you may have to do it a couple more takes but people who do that kind of work, uh, work that's a specialized kind of work you have to have already established yourself in that yeah as an actor or just in, in yeah and that's really important and that's something that i really regret in my life uh cat because i really missed out on an opportunity of of excelling myself moving forward further in in uh not only uh voiceovers but in radio uh you know look when you're 18 years old and i started really when i was 16 years old i thought about being in radio when i was seven when we lived in california my mom took me to uh, uh an audition in sacramento uh, for Huckleberry Finn and Tom Sawyer. And uh, she thought, well, maybe I might be able to get some part doing some, you know, play or something. And I was only about seven or eight years old. I wasn't really thinking much about acting or anything like that. But, and I have these pictures I was going to, I saved them to show you where I'm, I actually am sitting at a piano, which is music with a candelabra like Liberace. I'm sitting at a, 
I'm sitting at a I'm sitting at a typewriter and and I'm a writer. So and this and then I've got a picture of me holding a phone to my ear. Who'd have thunk at seven years, six years old, I'd be working in an on hold business and I'm holding a phone at my ear and six yeah. years old, right? So yeah, I really had this feeling I was going to be in that business. In fact, I was going to go to the Mel Blanc. You know who Mel Blanc is? Yeah, I do. Yeah, Mel Blanc is the guy who created a lot of cartoon characters. And I was going to go to the Mel Blanc School of Voice Characterization. <laughs> uh, the Mel Blanc School of Voice Characterization was in Los Angeles at that time. And I think it was $900. And let's face it, in 1956 or 57, $900 was a lot of money. My mom was lucky to put food on the table. And, you know, if we were lucky to have, you know, a couple of cans of beans in the cupboard, we were doing pretty good back in the day. I mean, I grew up during some really hard times uh, uh, in the 1950s because my mom being divorced a couple of times, you know, she was a single mom and then my sister came along. So it was tough. So by the time, you know, uh, I aged a little bit, then I became, uh, well, we came back home to Cleveland after my mom divorced her second husband, my sister's uh, father. And when we got back home to Cleveland, uh, then that's when I started to uh, think more seriously about wanting to get into radio. But I was bussing tables at a restaurant, you know, for 60 cents an hour. Yeah, I was making 60 cents an hour. Yeah. Wow. 60 cents an hour plus tips, bussing tables at Smith's restaurant. Okay. And that was my job. I mean, that's, that's what I had. So, uh, then my father, it turned out, uh, I didn't really have a good relationship with my dad because my mom had broken up and I'll tell you that story some other time. But the bottom line is that the fortunate thing was that my father, believe it or not, my dad knew one of the biggest radio personalities in Cleveland. That's Howie Lund. He was a big radio personality. Uh, he did the, uh, the, the, the oldies show. Howie Lund with you on the big band show here at WERE. And so at 16 years old, if you can imagine, at 16 years old, I was going down to the radio station and hanging out with Howie Lund and just kind of you know learning a little bit about what he's doing and that. So then... To fast forward a little further, then I got drafted, went into the military. I was in the army. I went overseas. And so when I was in Okinawa, I was in Okinawa after my basic training. And I, I went to, I wanted to in, in, uh, uh, involve myself with armed forces radio and television. I thought maybe I could be a DJ uh, in the military using armed forces radio and television. Unfortunately, they didn't have an opening, so I had to do something else. But I did go downtown to the radio station after my regular day, at, 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 you know, in the army. I got in a Scotia cab and I went downtown to Naha and I walked in this radio station and uh, just wanted to look around. And the program director there, he toured me around. He says, "Have you ever done radio before?" And I says, "Well." No, I haven't. I'm, I'm like, I'd like to get into it. He said, well, uh, can you read? Uh, well, yeah, I think I can. He handed me a piece of news copy. Yeah, he ripped a piece of news copy off the AP wire. He handed it to me. He says, here, read this. So I took the news copy and I read it. And he says, oh, my God you're hired. <laughs> he says, can you do the news for me tonight? We need a, a guy to read the news. So I read the news that night from seven to midnight on KSBK in Naha, Okinawa. And then the next, he said, can you come back tomorrow? And so when I came back the next day, he said, well, uh, uh, the guy that was supposed to be here, uh, he's not going to be here. Do you think you could do a DJ show? I had never been on the radio. That was <laughs> seriously, that, that what did you feel like to do that moment. Like when you, were, when you were coming in for that moment, were you nervous? I was because, first of all, I had never worked with anything like a mixing board and the cart machines. You know, it was it was all foreign to me. He said, ah, no problem. Just follow the clock. We had a format clock. OK, you play a hit here, an oldie there and, a you know, another hit here and then, a, a, you know, do a double play. And, you know, there's like a format clock you go by. And I just, you know, put the carts in there, push the buttons and just back sell the, uh, the spots and played the commercials. And then I did the newscast. And and he says, oh, my God, you did a whole show plus the news you know what how'd you like to work here at ksbk <laughs> and i said are you for real and he says yeah we, you're going to get paid you're i'll pay you to work here so well, i was minds can't think that way tom i just got, i've got to interrupt you you're like and then i put this in and then they're right <laughs> You've never had, you had, at that point, had never had any previous experience. None, Nikki. I had no experience whatsoever in broadcasting. That was my very, very first job in radio was at KSBK in Naha, Okinawa. I was in the military, but after work, I would go downtown and work at KSBK and do 7 to Midnight. Wow. Okay, and it was. So back to a previous thought I had. 
So you said when you were a kid, you pretty much knew you wanted to do this. So you never at any other point, you never at any point in your life thought, if I didn't do this, what would I do? Well, let me put it to you this way. I uh, kind of, I, I don't know how to say this. It, it's difficult to kind of, what my mom always wanted to do something in the entertainment business herself, but I never really knew that then. All I know is my mom liked to listen to the music on the radio. And back then we didn't have, you know, uh, tapes uh, like we have. We don't, we didn't have digital, you know, we didn't even have cassettes. We had 78 RPM, okay? Then we had 33 and a third. Remember records, vinyl records, okay? 45s. <laughs> we, hey, we didn't even have 45s back then. Wow. No <laughs> and I always loved all different kinds of music. I used to listen to country music. I used to listen to classical music. My mom uh, loved uh, Shostakovich and uh, and Tchaikovsky and a lot of the, uh, the classics. Uh, uh, Ravel's Bolero was one of her favorites, and I'd sit and listen to classical music, but the radio was always on. She had one in her bedroom and one in the kitchen, and that's when I said, yeah, I'm, I want to be on the air. I want to be a DJ, but no, at that time, I wasn't thinking about it, and I didn't know my mom had other aspirations herself. She wanted to also do writing, but what I also didn't know was that my mom was a musician. She played harmonica. Even at an early age, she used to play harmonica, and later on, she actually joined a harmonica band, and she was center stage in a harmonica band later on in her in her life but not as a career just for fun you know but to answer your question again more directly uh no i really didn't i wanted to go to broadcasting school even in california uh, but i was too young and then by the time i got back to cleveland i'm in my teens now even before the army uh i didn't really know what direction to take and i was just taking whatever jobs came along in fact for a while i even worked in hospital work i worked in nursing homes i did patient care for a good number of years Wow. Gotcha. <laughs> You've done a lot. So I, I don't know if that answered your question. Do we have any other questions, Tom Schaefer? Anything? No, because you know what? I thought he did. I, you guys don't see this, but I see it coming through. Because sometimes when Tom comes, Tom Schaefer we comes do. on. We um, do. Actually, another oh, shout out. Like, um, we have Ned Albright. Gonna... Ned Albright. Hi, Ned. Wait. Hey, Ned. Hey, Ned. Hey, Ned. Love you. Did, is he on? Did he have? Did he have a question? Yeah, I was just trying to. Uh, uh, he, uh, he... <laughs> Ned, he says, loving the interview with Tom Vernon. He's a true pro. Question, question. Okay, he says, how did he practice to become the pro that he is, and does he continue to practice? And what does he do to prepare for a gig? Good question. Good question. And we have yeah. one other question as well. Yeah. Oh, go ahead. What's the other question? One other question as well, and that's Betts Wilson asked. Would you ever consider going back to radio? Okay, oh, good question. <laughs> and with my amnesia, remind me in case I forget the questions again. <laughs> Let's go with Ned's first. Well, I'm getting kind of old at my age now. You know, <laughs> I'm feeling as it used to be. But uh, to answer Ned's question, um, I don't really practice per se. I mean, I'm not saying I'm the best. I don't need to practice. Look, I wanted to be an actor. I really wanted to go to acting school. That's something I wanted to do because I found out later in life, you can't just be a DJ all the time, just announcing the records like that all the time at KSBK. That, that's not really doing voiceover work. That's doing a DJ's work, okay? To do voiceover work, to do commercials, to really get into that aspect of it, you either have to take acting classes, which I never did, that's the problem. I never went to acting school. And that's something that I regret. I spent so much time as a DJ and I wasn't thinking about the acting. But when I started realizing that, hey, if I'm going to do this seriously, because that could lead to union work. If you get into the union, yeah. now you get the big paying j uh, gigs, right? Uh, at, rather than just the local yokels that are you know, have just a little bit of money to spend. And that's another thing, too, as, uh, as to how lucrative it is financially. And coming into it, I wasn't thinking about money. Uh, back then. I just wanted to get it, uh, the exposure and the experience of doing it. So I guess really to answer that question, it was a matter of practicing back then as I was going along. Somebody would hand me a script. Okay. I'd look at the script. I'd see what it was about. I'd read the copy and I can probably understand, well, this is how you're supposed to interpret it. Well, when I did that for radio stations, I guess somebody caught on and said, well, I guess he sort of understands the, the verbiage and how it works. So now I started to get more 
uh, agency work. I was starting to get agency calls where I would go down to Coral Gables, for example. Like one day I went down there and they needed, uh, they did this mall spot. Edward J. D. Bartolo, cat. I don't know if you remember. Remember Edward J. D. Bartolo? I do, yeah. Oh, do you? Okay. Yeah. Edward J. For all those that don't know, Edward J. D. Bartolo was probably one of the biggest uh, guys who owned all the malls here in South Florida. Oh, wow. Uh, yeah. The Aventura, Dade Land Mall, you, know, you name it. He owned all the malls. Well, guess what? They asked me to go down to this recording studio in Coral Gables. And if I could, they had some kind of an event going on at all the malls. And my job was to take this little piece of copy that they gave me. It was a little tag, a tag on the end. And a tag, for those who may not know, is just a little blurb, a little 10-second tag. It says, you know, uh, join us this weekend at the Aventura Mall for the ba da 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 You know, join us at the Galleria this weekend at the da 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 So you go in the Mayfair in the gallery, and you just, every one of them are the same, but they're for different locations. And they're all 10 seconds each. So I got $200 a piece for those, and I walked out of there with $2,000 in less than 10 minutes. Wow. Which is extraordinary. Back then, it was. <laughs> so when I saw and, that... It, actually, to go back to Ned's point, sorry, Tom, yeah. I, I will say that uh, for Ned, I b because Tom is constantly doing script after, you know, 30 scripts or 20 scripts a day, that that, that really is, I, I would guesstimate, and I'm putting words in your mouth, Tom, but... Uh, that really is the daily battering of of learning and and um, honing your craft. Um, well, you're absolutely right, Kat. And my problem with that now, okay, you have to realize I'm going to be 70 years old in November. So, wow, ooh, ooh, oh, yeah, I don't know if it's cause for celebration or not. <laughs> <laughs> but thank you for the confidence. I appreciate it. Go, oh, 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 oh. <laughs> oh, my maker, please. Not yet. Not till the show is over, at least. <laughs> yes, please. Not till the show is over. Okay. <laughs> mayday, mayday. Come on, Hart. Come on, Hart. You know I what? I'm going to call you out on something now. Huh? Right oh. Wait, yeah. I got to call you up on this wonderful moment that I think that everybody will get a kick out of. You like this? What is happening right now? I know. I put my foot up on my desk, and nope, none I of you wish I can see this. That. I wish y'all could see this. That's me relaxing. Um, this is my version of relaxing. Um, <laughs> Tom, would you like to tell the audience about that one voiceover that you did? Wait, did he answer oh. Bex's question? <laughs> oh wait, wait! We got to answer Betsy's question right after. Oh yeah, the yeah. I'm sorry. I got, I got it. I've got to. All right. Well, you, you keep, you keep your, you keep, your, you, keep you, you keep that question in your head for a moment. Okay. But I want to, I want to finish answering her question. I'm not sure. There was a second part to the question that I forgot what it was that she was asking. Would you go back to radio? Huh? What about what? Well, would I go back to radio? Would you go back to radio. Well, yeah, yeah. I mean, let me just try to do it as quickly as I can. You know, after spending so many years in broadcasting as an on-air personality, uh, I realized that uh, it wasn't. I couldn't move forward anymore because uh, I hadn't stayed in one station long enough to establish myself as a de facto premier DJ. In other words, let me put it to you this way: No, I'm not Larry Lujak in Chicago. No, I'm. I'm not. Uh, uh, whoever the, the guy, Larry Morrow or any of the other Larry's out there, you know, I'm not even, Tom, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, look, I'm not even Tom Vernon. Okay. If you want to know the truth, and I'll tell you this, that I'll tell is, that's the most true. <laughs> yeah. And, and I'll tell you what, if Ron Tater is tuned into this broadcast, he'll know exactly what I'm talking about. Cause he's the guy that gave me the name Tom Vernon. And I'll tell you that story later, but to answer that question, finally answer it, uh, was that, uh, I thought about going back into radio a couple of years ago, but radio itself has changed so dramatically that I have uh, a soured, uh, I, 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 it soured me. I, I don't really like radio today uh, like it used to be back in the day where you could actually have fun. It's all internet streaming now. All the good stations are gone. Uh, you know, I'm too old now. I mean, I can rock and roll. I mean, if you want me to do that, but you know, what am I going to get? $7 an hour? I can't live on that. No, to be a radio DJ, you're not going to get more than $12 an hour. That's about it. That's what they pay today in broadcasting. And that sucks. I'm not going to lie to you. So why would I spend eight, you know, well, not eight hours. You wouldn't be on the air eight hours. You're usually only on the air four hours uh, on a radio station. Yeah. But uh, to do broadcasting, I thought it'd be more lucrative to do commercials and voiceovers. So that's where I've tried 
to spend more of my time and uh, by doing national stuff like I have, like I've done Burger King, I've done McDonald's, I've done IHOP, I've done United Airlines. I, I have done a lot of national stuff, including documentaries for PBS. I'm very proud to say that one of the most recent things I just did was for uh, an Emmy Award winning television producer by the name of Barrett Moronian, who was at Channel 2. He actually produced a documentary for PBS called Orphans of the Genocide, and it's aired on every major t a PBS station in the country, and it's been seen by more than 7 million people around the world already, and I'm on the entire two-hour documentary. So I'm very proud of that accomplishment in my life, and it's not about the money. I'm not really in it for the money, truthfully. I'm in this industry because I enjoy doing what I do. But now, to be honest with you, yes, I've been here 26 years doing on hold advertising. And I've done, you You can't go to a city in America that I'm not on some phone system. I'm on, I'm in every single, <laughs> the truth. I'm not bragging. I'm not, I'm just no, telling it's, you. It's the truth. It's I, I swear to God, I, I was shocked. I couldn't believe it. I mean, you go to Los Angeles, you go to Milwaukee. I don't care what city you go to, you know, Poe Duncan, wherever, you know, there's an on hold message that's got me on it somewhere. So, you know, but the problem is that, you know, I'm not really getting anything for the on hold productions, you know, unless I was running my own company and then getting a, a, a kick of it. But the, my part is coming in and doing it. So, yeah, to answer that question, would I go back in radio? No. And now I'm in this. What do I do? Well, I, I don't know. I, I, at this point in my life, I'm not really sure, uh, Beth, what I should do with my life. I have so much background in what I have done, but it doesn't seem to be helping me moving forward at age 70. Well, I, you really have a supremely awesome voice. You and, really and do. I'm not sure that now Nikki and I have heard a whole bunch of your your um, promos, radio promos, on hold messaging. I've, I've, I've heard more than you. <laughs> but <laughs> I, I will tell you, you really are a supremely talented, Tom. And there are some really hysterical stories that I really want to talk about before we dig into some other yeah you can't wait to get me on I this got one. You, baby. And the reason I do is because it's just funny Tom. now i know where you came up with that logo you're in it to win it, win it. <laughs> okay here's one of them audience oh audience uh tom fernan i will not tell specifics of this because we probably get in trouble but Tom, not on the first show. Not on, not on the first show. <laughs> we don't want to not at least after the third drink, right? <laughs> <laughs> now that I've had five glasses of coffee. Let's really talk it. Um, no, so so. <laughs> hey, uh, Nikki, have you ever heard of Mal Malbec? Yes, Mal I have. Malbec wine. Yes. Is that what you're drinking? That's oh dear Lord! Bad. Don't put that there because we we're not we don't I don't know. Can we put? Barefoot there? I don't know. We're not on national television. It's okay. It's okay. You can we didn't call her by name until you did. My bad. I called it out. So no, this is this is this is great though. I want to talk about that one moment. Um, when you edited, I'm sorry, when you failed to edit properly. Okay, so here's the deal. I fa wait, I failed to edit properly live on radio and I cursed on the air. Let me tell you that. And that was I'm very embarrassing. <laughs> I'm not going to tell the curse word, but audience, listen, uh, Tom and I would, would mill out like 30 scripts a day, which we would, we would read into a microphone mm -hmm. in a padded room, read, 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 get it, edit where we may or may not have said something perhaps we shouldn't have said. Hold on two seconds, Tom Schaefer. We got a question. Um, I, I got you, Schaefer. I got you. But this is important. We may or may not have edited out what we should not have said in the script. And then we lay it to a sound bed. Um, there was one time, I'm not going to say what it was, but I will tell you, this is ridiculous. Tom decided we were having a tough day. We had 30 scripts each. We were going, 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 running and gunning, and he forgot to edit out a couple curse words because we have a very specific script writer who decided that it was important not to write a script. So for those of you who don't know uh, voiceover world, it's important that we have a script that is straight through because our job is to, you know, do- Are you talking about this kind of stuff? Yes, don't show it because people will know that. That look at that. That look, wait, show it again because I think it's important. Don't show it. Don't show it. Okay, again. well, just, wait, wait, just wait, this wait. part right here. Just just this part right here. 
beautiful. Nobody wow. can see it, but it's enough to be able to see that. For scribble, a place, scribble, scribble, and like highlights in all different directions. And our job is to say, "Hi, thanks for calling Lexus, New York City." Da 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 da. And, and you're trying to find your way through the script, and it's ridiculous. And at one point, Tom Vernon. Did not edit out a I'm very angry curse word. Um, and it was not towards the person who owned it. It was towards one of our uh, script writers from ages ago. And it went to playback that way. I'll never forget because you are immaculate, Tom Vernon. When it comes to all your elements, bump, 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 you've got it down to a science. You read it and you do it so quickly. It's a read. I mean, it's ridiculous. If you guys saw him in action, he does, do, 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 do. It's, it's like a structure. Wow. But this time we were having a tough day and he just was so angry because we got so many of these scripts from this particular person mm -hmm. and it went to playback with the curse word in it. And I have never laughed so hard in my <laughs> life when, when the playback art person came back and said, do you remember, <laughs> do you remember what happened? She, she flew through your door. It was, do you remember that moment? Uh, well, barely. I've been trying to forget it, but yeah. <laughs> but once she left, Tom Vernon and I have never laughed. So I mean, we just, I went over, I said, what happened? He said, apparently I didn't edit out a specific curse word. I said, oh, heavens. <laughs> it was funny. That's and then I mean, the only other, oh, wait, wait, hold on. Tom Schaefer, you got a question. All right, just a uh, quick note about what's happening in the chat room. Uh, okay. Tony Crabtree mentioned, she said, Tom never mentioned the scripts that he's writing. She said, excellent. And, oh, yes. and a, a, a little bit of a tip there for you, Tom, to kind of back off from the mic a little. Oh, I'm um, sorry. Am I coming that to That was Tony's tip. So that was from oh, Tony. Okay. I'm <laughs> to see that. And Bet said, I just think you're such an amazing personality. That's it's radio's loss. So maybe you'll think about doing something maybe on uh, the internet, maybe Tom. That's a good idea. Well, actually, thank you. Uh, as I have been approached by several people about doing an internet uh, radio show, a streaming show. I have a friend of mine up in Chicago, Gary Bernstein, who has worked down here in South Florida and he's moved back home to Chicago. And he and I have been talking a little bit about putting uh, a show together and doing uh, something similar to what you've just described. Tom Caminiti over at Magic, One, who used to work at Magic 102, a good friend of mine, uh, he's approached me. So, uh, you know, and I have several other friends in the biz who uh, are thinking about the same thing. And I don't mind uh, considering that. Uh, if, if we can build an audience, I don't mind doing that. Not at all. Would love that. Now, you know what? I, I want to jump into something. Um, we're not going to end on a negative note, but I, I do, I do, I do want to talk about this because I think it's really valuable and I think it's really important. And and Nikki and I have been friends for a long time and 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 know the ups and downs of depression and all the little elements that go with it. And I want you to talk to the audience just for a brief moment about the elements that you. Um, Fight. I'm going to call you a champion because you fight against it for, for the better part of uh, 20 years. I've watched you really fight hard against some some challenging moments in your life. And I think the audience will see you as this incredible powerhouse and this voice and this essence and uh, coming from all these radio backgrounds and voiceover work. But they don't know some of the demons you fight. And I would like for them to know about it, if you wouldn't mind chatting a little about it. Well, let me just premise this by saying uh, that back as early as uh, childhood, uh, I'm not going to say that I realized that I was different from everybody else, uh, but I realized that I was shy. And as a matter of fact, I did not want to stand up in front of a crowd of people and do a book report, uh, you know, standing and, and trying to talk publicly. As a matter of fact, I, and this is not a commercial, but I found this book, believe it or not. And this book actually is called Smart Speaking. And, uh, and in it, you can just literally just open up a, a thing and, and it's like a 60 second thing. Like, uh, you know, I, I'm never too sure whether someone wants to keep talking to me. So, you know, and you just open this thing. Is there a best way to answer the telephone at work? Here's another one. I don't know how to change the subject when I'm bored to tears. And all these little things. They're just, <laughs> they're, 
Right. And they're just they're just like one liners. And, and, and then when you see that one line question, then boom, you just got, whoa, that applies to me. Boom, that applies to me. So whoever these ladies are, they literally wrote my biography and don't even realize it because I, <laughs> I, I literally could tell you the whole story based on, on these questions that pop out. But to go back and answer your question as a young child, as a young kid. Yeah, I had uh, insecure moments. I don't think I, I, tr I didn't try to show it. I tried not to show any insecurity, but you have to remember that, well, you know, let me just put it to you bluntly. Um, when I grew up as a child, I did not like children at all. I did not like other children. I did not like being around children at all. I didn't, I didn't want to be like them. I realized there was something a little bit different about me, even as a child. And let me just say one more thing. You said possibly people would think this was weird, but I'm going to tell you anyway. I'm going to say it because I think, you know, if I'm weird or not, okay, so be it. <laughs> Own it. <laughs> Don't ever come to my webpage again, then, if that's how you feel. <laughs> uh, but when I was born, okay. I was born cesarean section. I didn't come down the birth canal. And I remember before I was born, I actually have the, the preconceived feelings of knowing what was about to happen. And when they cut my mother open and I popped out, I mean it, I swear to God, this is the God's honest truth. I'm not making this up and I'm not trying to get publicity out of it. I'm just saying this is what happened to me. I came out and whether my eyes were open or not, I don't remember. But when I got out of there, I said, oh, well, those are green tiles on the wall. Oh, those are fluorescent lights. Oh, that clock says 604. Now, how would a baby know that? How would a newborn infant know it says 604 on that clock? How would a baby know those are green tiles and those are fluorescent lights? I had some kind of a, a, an extra sensory sense about myself. So to cut to the chase, as I got a little older, I realized I was different from other kids. And that's why I didn't feel comfortable around them. And I gravitated to, more toward adults. Well, being that my mother was rather dysfunctional herself because she had problems in her life with her mom, disassociating from her and the rejection she got from her two husbands and my sister who later supposedly committed suicide uh, at age 18, which is a sad story too. Uh, there was a lot of tragedy going on even in the early days. So to answer that question directly, I started to feel like, well, not insecure, but different. And I had to kind of keep to myself and stay private. But over the last two decades, I've realized that I have this condition where uh, bipolar really has taken over my life. The bipolar condition, the flip-flop, yin and yang, in and out, hot and cold, salt and pepper, black and white. You know, it's like, you know, I'm one minute I can be happy and I'm doing this and that. And the next minute I just want to, you know, who cares what I do, right? I just really don't care about life anymore. And that is how I, I live my life every single day. And I don't take meds. I don't take any medications for my bipolar disability, but it leads to depression. And that certainly has impeded my career. You're right. It does, in, in fact, impact my ability to stay focused now, which is a challenge. So even working for you and trying to keep those deadlines going is a bit of a challenge. And I appreciate you working with me and understanding that I'm doing the best I can. And I want to get past that, but I don't want to go on drugs. I do not. I feel if I go on drugs, it's going to stifle my creativity. That's why I've never touched drugs. That was, so, about to, that was about to be my question. Was there a reason why you just decided you didn't want to do it? So, Yeah. And then my lifestyle, Nikki, uh, to be truthful about it, I'm being open with you. Uh, my lifestyle is of that persuasion. And so, you know, there are many people like me in the broadcast in industry, in the entertainment industry, uh, but I kept it quiet. You know, not a lot of people know. Uh, pretty much everybody, all my friends know about me, but I don't go around bragging or anything, but you know, it's not a big deal, but I don't go flaunting myself. You know, I came up in the seventies during the disco era. So I was like partying and disco. <laughs> and, and, yeah, I bet I've been to every bar that you could imagine. Okay. Yeah. We're changing our lighting. Oh, please. Oh, okay. Uh, but anyway, Nikki, yeah. So that aspect of it, that particular aspect of it, what you may have been alluding to, I don't know if that's what you were alluding to. No, not at all. Just oh, okay. But that, that certainly uh, probably crossed my mind that I need to be careful, you know, why I exited the military, you know, why I didn't stay there. And we won't go into that right now. I'll be glad to tell that story. But 
you know, that just impacted me. But no, I just kept busy doing my radio thing. But unfortunately, uh, as years went on, I found myself getting deeper and deeper into the depression and the, the melancholy and wishing that everything could be the way it used to be. When I look around and see people today that are so, you know, uh, spaced out on their technology and they don't even want to communicate with each other, it saddens me. Humanity saddens me today, you know. I really feel bad because uh, we, we really uh, lost our identity as a species here on planet Earth. And I could talk volumes just on that subject alone. And when I look at what's around me, it doesn't give me hope that people will ever change. Because look, Kat, you can preach and preach all you like. I'm talking about me now. We can preach and preach all we like. But unless people are open-minded and they want to listen, they're not going to they're not going to want to change. They've got to be the change themselves, That's you know? True. You know, it's like saying, uh, somebody says, well, be the force. No, be the spirit. The spirit is just like a force, but it's in a different way. The, the spirit will bring on the force. You don't just think of the force being a force of energy. No, it's, it's, a, it's a force of, of spiritualism. And that's what's missing in this world today is spiritualism and companionship and love and understanding and patience. I totally agree. I totally agree. Totally totally agree. Totally and, this, and this thing right here is the curse of America, to be frank with you about it. it, I was it say, what is that? I can't see. It's a cell phone. Hold on, take my glasses. <laughs> Where are my glasses? Where are your glasses? I don't, I don't know. know. I need my glasses. Yeah. Hey, you know what? I can't see with them and I can't see without them. So, you know, what can I say? <laughs> I've had mine since the eighth grade and she asked me if she could have mine. I told her I needed them myself. Exactly. Yeah. I can't see. By the way, Kat, I was going to dress up in a zoot suit tonight, but uh, well, I, I got to tell you the reason why I didn't dress up in my zoot suit. Okay. <laughs> No, 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 you got to hear this. Okay, you ready? Uh, I wanted to wear the zoot suit, okay, like a gangster. I have the hat and everything. You know, I, I had a nice pink hat, and I have a black suit, you know, with the pinstripes on it. And I got the pocket watch with the chain on it. And I got the spats. Oh, you would have loved my suit. But guess what? Yeah. Guess what, Cat? I was in Los Angeles a couple of months back. And you know what? I got arrested. I got arrested for wearing a zoot suit. Yeah. Did you know, Kat, it's illegal to wear a zoot suit in Los Angeles today? You're fibbing me. Nope, I'm not. Look it up on Google. You'll find out. There's a law in Los Angeles that says if you're caught wearing a zoot suit, you can go to jail. You're not fibbing me right now? Nope. I did not know that. Seriously? Yeah. So, I'm so I'm kidding about oh, not wearing... Where is it? <laughs> I'm I'm ki I'm kidding about the zoot suit. I mean, I'm kidding about I'm kidding about the, the fact that... The, oh. No, no, no. The zoot suit is, uh, thing is real. But I, I said that because I definitely wanted to let you know that this was an informal thing. I didn't need to dress up with us. <laughs> listen, I dressed up and so did Nikki. So you should have dressed up. No, listen, I wore my best t-shirt. Uh, I wore my best uh, shirt. So, <laughs> so wait, I want to talk about something funny. This is hysterical. First and foremost. Wait, did, wait, did I answer Nikki's question about <laughs> bipolar and depression? Yes. Okay. I mean, if you have any more to, to ask me about it, I'm open and I will go into that detail about it because I got a really good book uh, that I found out that is wonderful for people that are creative people like you and her and me and others in this industry who have this condition, but they're all creative people and they're doing great. What's you know? the name of the book? The name of the book is Touched with Fire, and it's by, I think, K. Jameson Redfield, or K. Redfield Jameson. But it's called Touch with Fire, and it was just recently, within the last few months, released as a, a movie. They came out oh. with a movie with oh, the same name. Yeah, you're going to like it. Mm -hmm. You should see that. Field trip. Um, field trip. We're going to sit down we're and watch the field trip. Oh, cool. Yeah, we do. Yeah, all right. Pumpernickel and Wonder Bread. Yeah. Hey, by the way, hi. We're going to call the show Pumpernickel and Wonder Bread. Listen, yeah. Nikki and I have pumped iron in the gym together, and that was our joke oh, yes. of self. Oh, and, it, and how did you get that nickname, Nikki? Yeah, you tell him, Nikki. I think I just kind of gave it to myself, didn't I? Yeah, you did. But I started calling her Wonder. And why? Because I am. <laughs> I know you want the truth. I came into the gym. Okay, let's call a shot like it is. No shame in my game. I'm very pale, like Wonder Bread. And I came in with like super duper ultra mega spray tan. And it looked it ridiculous. Great. It great. <laughs> She's like, what is that? No. <laughs> I guess I looked not so tan. Let's just say I was trying really hard. So we yeah, joked back and forth. We like to make 
fun of ourselves. It's good. Yeah, it it's is good. good. It's well, that's about the only, that's really the, the best way to handle, especially for me now. I'm speaking from on behalf of myself. The best way for me to handle a lot of it is to uh, to change my mood by doing character voices. Look, I was doing cartoonish type voices as a kid. I would, you know, I would see cartoons and I, and I see a voice like this, you know, and maybe, you know, or I'd change my voice a little bit like that, you know, or, you know, sometimes <laughs> I sound a little like that, you know, country. So, yeah, I just started playing around with it. And that's kind of how all that happened. The real one that really is my de facto, he's the guy, the buddy that hangs out with me. I did a commercial for uh, a, a member when they carried beepers around. Remember beepers? Go beep, 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 beep. Remember that before cell phones? Well, 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 this was back when AT&T was not AT&T. Uh, that was Bell South Mobility. And Bell South was big. And Bell South uh, at that time had one of the biggest beeper companies in South Florida. And they asked me to come in and do the spot for them. So uh, along with uh, Jim Richards, uh, the radio personality who I worked with at the radio station, we went down there one day and we did this, this ad. And so he was asking me the questions and I would respond. And I had to do three voices. I had to do... Uh, uh, a, a porcupine, a snail, and an owl. Those three voices I had to do. So I had to do, you know, the porcupine, the porcupine. People are pretty sensitive about how I keep in contact. So mostly I don't. I mean, it's hard for me to stay close to any situation. <laughs> <All right. Get laughs> and the owl, who the about me? Who, who, who? People think all we owls they ever say is, who, me? Oh, I could have, but I didn't. You know, so, you know, so I, I ended up doing... The, yeah, I mean, I did those three voices, but but the porcupine, for some reason or another, the porcupine is the one that seems to be my kind of uh, my, my right hand guy. OK, he's the guy that follows me around all the time. I always go into that voice all the time. <laughs> <laughs> what kind of a voice do you want? You tell me, Catherine. What do you want? <laughs> There's so many voices in our head. I can be sweet too. I can be sweet. I can do a girl. I can do a baby. I can do all of those things. Maybe perhaps a British accent. That was Cockney. British no. accent. No, you want? I got. Hey, I got to give a shout out. I got to give a shout out. You want a British voice? Leslie Staples, and she's uh, on YouTube. She's. Pro I don't. Know, she's in England right now with her son. With her son Nick. Yeah. Her son is. His name is Nick. OK, and they're in England. She's going over to England to visit them. So they're walking around and stuff. Well, Leslie and I became friends because she did work for us here at American Impact and yeah. as a British woman. Well, I at, when I first met her, I didn't know her background, but she's done stuff for BBC in, in, in England, in London. Yeah, she's a big actress over in London. Right. Anyway, so. Uh, yeah, if you want to do British voice, you really need to hire somebody like Leslie Staples because <laughs> yeah, let her do it because she is British. Or Tom, Tom Schaefer, he can do Tom it. can do. <laughs> Tom is very good. Yeah, you know what? I've heard him do several voices. He's definitely got the ability uh, to do that work. Yeah, he did. He was doing some yeah. sort of British thing. <laughs> Listen, do you want to talk about that time where you? Had, okay, I, I I have to just because oh, I'm yeah, so yeah. humorous. Okay, so. Back in the day, you talked to me about this one voiceover thing you had to do where you had to mock having sex. I have to bring it up because it is my worst nightmare to have to sit across from another human being. Yeah, but you know, but you, but you know, but you know what? You just gave everybody the spoiler because oh, it's darn it. I yeah. never told you I was a good comedian. Wait, okay, did I just totally ruin that? Yeah, you, well, yeah, because you know what? The the whole funny part of that thing is not knowing what it was before I even walked into the studio. I had no idea what it was. <laughs> oh, wait, wait, wait. I didn't know that. No. Know this, were, okay, that's the part I messed up on. So I messed right. up. Tell the story. Well, you already gave it away. They already know it. Got it. Oh, all right. Screw it. Screw it. <laughs> Now I know why they call you cat. <laughs> okay, so now I know why you're a dog lover. Hey, by the way, how's Princess? She's good. Princess. She's in a corner crying. Okay. So, but that was funny. When you told me about that. Yeah, story, yeah okay. You want to hear the story? Okay. 
aim and you were talking about how you actually had to mock having sex across the microphone. Yeah, well, I didn't want to tell him. I wanted I wanted to give that as the punchline. But I went into the recording studio up in North Miami. And this is where uh, up in North Miami, you're probably familiar with that area, Kat. Yeah. You know, at that time, uh, it was I think it was called Studio uh, City almost, like in California. Uh, and there is a studio center up there right by Channel 2. There's Channel 2 at the end of the street, which, and that street was actually named... Um, um, uh, after the, uh, what do you call it? The, um, um, uh, the, the, PBS show for kids. What's it called? Um, Sesame Street. Sesame Street. Exactly. Thank you, <laughs> you, Nikki. <laughs> <laughs> what you did she say? I didn't hear her. Her age. I did not. Oh, I no numbers. She didn't. She said, I'm the youngest one sitting here. Okay. Next. Okay. All right. So anyway, uh, and, and by the way, yeah, I want to, I, I, when I get done telling my story, I want to just tell really quickly about the channel two thing. But, uh, as far as up there in that area, there are a lot of uh, other studios up in that area by channel two, uh, you know, in North Miami. So I had been working up there for some time and, uh, he called me up and asked me to come in for this job, but he wouldn't tell me what it was. He says, Tom, I need you for a job. And, uh, well, I can't go into it right now, but uh, can you come up here this afternoon? I said, well, yeah, sure. I'll be up there. So I said, uh, so I get, well, I wonder what this could be. I'm getting a little nervous about it. Maybe I can't do it, you know? So I get in there, walk in, and I'm the only one there. And he says, okay, go in there and, uh, you know, get ready by the, by the mic. <laughs> and, and I noticed there were two microphones there and normally in, in a voiceover booth like that there's only one but this time there were two mics on the stands right but nobody else was in there just me i was by myself and there he is in the control room and i say okay well i'm here what do i do now he said well uh just hold on wait and then i said but no you hold on i don't have a script <laughs> You don't need one. Where's the script? I need a script to record something. <laughs> he said, ah, uh, well, you're not going to need a script for this time. I said, really? He said, no, just be yourself. Well, let's face it. <laughs> Being myself can be anything you can imagine. You got to give me more than that. Okay. So I said, geez, I wonder what this is going to be. And I was getting a little nervous about it. Then all of a sudden in walks this girl. I didn't know her from Adam, never saw her in, in my life. I didn't know she ever did voiceover work or not. All I know is there's a girl shows up. She walks in the control room, the studio there, and the door closes behind us. Now I'm here and she's over there. Then he says, okay, guys, go for it. Do it. Mm, make it happen. <laughs> and so I said, what are we supposed to make happen? He says, no, you know, get into it. Do it, man. You know, oh yeah, you want to do it with her, don't you? You want to get it on with her, you know? And he's like prodding me to kind of get into the mood to be sexual. And I says, oh my God, I got to be sexual and I'm gay? Come on, I'm not even interested in women. How can I have sex with a woman when I'm that, of that persuasion? <laughs> I had to fake it. I had to fake that whole <laughs> orgasm, okay? <laughs> That's what I find so humorous. Oh, my God. And here we are. We're going back and forth, and I'm not going to use the profanity, Catherine. I promise I won't use the profanity. But <laughs> you know what it goes, you know. Oh, 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 I want to go. Oh, yeah, come on. Oh, do it. Oh, oh, yeah, man. And you can just <laughs> oh, yeah, the emotions, and then those cuss words and all that sexual stuff, and it was coming out, and there it is. And, oh, 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 God. Oh, God. <laughs> Yeah, do it to me. Oh, yeah, what? Uh, and I had to go through that. Oh, my God. Oh, no. And you know what? You know what I got paid for that? $10. No. You would have to pay me $10. I didn't know what it paid. It was an ad in a newspaper, and he grabbed it and said I'd be perfect for it. I got 10 bucks for it. $10? $10, for, $10 for that VO. I'm sorry. I made sex for 10 freaking dollars. <laughs> Tell you what, I find that to be hysterical because there most people don't recognize all of the things that they hear that they if you can't see you hear it, it's a voiceover. Right. So to answer Beth's question, she says, So you want to get into voiceover, right? Do you want to get into voiceover now? <laughs> Voice one, two, three, you might be called for one of these shots. Uh, no, I tell you what. There is some crazy stuff out there. That's that, when you told me that story, that just cracked me up. I mean, it really, honestly, because insane. I, first off, 
ten dollars, ten dollars to do that. That's awesome. And that's so not Tom's character that's to awesome. do that either. So that's what made it so. Funny. Hey, I've worked for free in a lot of places too. So you know. <laughs> Tom, I'm so so glad you came on. I know we've gone on for over an hour, and oh, I know I'm sorry. Yeah, I mean. Minutes. I'm so sorry, Kat, because you know what? There was so much that I had hoped we would have. I knew 45 minutes would go by quickly. Ah, and it's true. I, I really had a lot of stories and anecdotes to talk about the radio industry itself and what I had to experience coming up through all those stations and the failures and successes and then the, the disappointment that I didn't stay in the business and move forward like I should have. But now to go back to Tony Crabtree's question, I believe, uh, that Tom Schaefer asked uh, about my writing. Uh, I have to have kind of a, I have to have a little bit of a, how shall I say it, uh, something in my back pocket. Uh, because look, it, if I can't do this for the rest of my life, what if my voice goes out? What if, you know, I can't do it anymore? Uh, I've got to have something, right? What can I do? Fortunately, I feel that I have somewhat of an ability to write and I'm, I'm doing a little bit of creative experimentation, if you will. Uh, I do write. I write commercials. I've written for ad agencies, so I know how to write copy. But I've never written novels, and I've never written screenplays. And now I'm really getting into screenplays. I have about five projects. One four, well, maybe one fourth, one third of the way finished. One is almost half finished. Screenplays for television and film that I'm already doing, and that's what Tony's referring to as my screenplay work. And I'm working on right now on a, on a one called A Visitor's Gift which I hope to pitch to the Hallmark Channel because I want feel-good stories. I want people to feel good about themselves. And if they can tune in and watch something that's going to make them feel good about themselves, that's the kind of uh, uh, programming that I want to give to others. And in fact, I'm planning on starting my own network uh, of that ilk that will hopefully showcase good feel-good programming for radio, television, and film. And The Visitor's Gift, I hope to pitch to Hallmark, so that's one thing. So yeah, my screenwriting, hopefully, that will carry me on through my glory days. As, as I exit stage left, as Snagglepuss says. As Snagglepuss, <laughs> it, 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 and I didn't mean to interrupt you, but I will say it absolutely will. You are a great voice of artist, but you are also a really great writer. And you really think and a on fabulous a, human being. Yeah, absolutely. And a fabulous human being. You've been you've been extraordinary to me. I will say that. And I'm tremendously grateful for you. And I'm wishing you all the success in the future. Well, thank you I, very I, much. I know it's I'm, it's gonna roll into writing because you you have a lot to write about and you you're just that go-getter. You're a champion that way. So it'll happen. Mm-hmm. Well, this is something that my mom always wanted to do. And my mom just passed away uh, two years ago. That was very traumatic. But when I f went up there and I found some of the stuff in my mom's belongings that I didn't even know my mom was into. And when I saw some of the writing that she did, and she actually wrote a story. She always writes it with her maiden name, Dorothy Marie Kern. But this particular one story that I found, I don't know, a miracle. I found the story and it was written by Anonymous. My mom wrote the word anonymous on there. And the, when I started reading the story, I said, oh, these characters, you know, this girl's name is Sarah and, the, and her brother's name is Robert. Well, Robert, I got to tell you this quick story. I know you want to get off the air. But no. when I saw this, uh, I knew that Robert was a name that my mom wanted to call me. She wanted to name me Robert. So when I started reading the story and Robert's name was in this little story she wrote, I got curious and I kept reading it. It turns out that the story's about a girl who unfortunately is sad because she feels distance from, distant from her mom. And I knew my sister did when my, her stepfather moved out of our lives and my mom divorced him. And now she lost her father, right? And now her brother, Robert, goes off to the army. Robert is me. Yeah. I oh. the army. So the story basically, I, be I believed, was about my sister and me and that whole thing. And in that story, it, the story goes on to say that my sister had all kinds of uh, drug problems, hanging out with the wrong people, and that uh, unfortunately that was her demise. But the police said that it was suicide. But when I read my mom's story, I got a little hint that there, it might have been more than suicide. I believe that she was actually killed. I believe my sister was killed by somebody in a gang-related uh, situation up there and that my mom maybe was trying to let that out. Now that I found that story, I may even try to write that story and bring that out and see if I can do a screenplay with it. But I just thought I'd share that with you because I thought that was kind of interesting to read that story about my sister and my mom was writing a story about that, you know, so I don't know. Yeah. Your mom was a writer too. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And a harmonica player. Yeah. All of that. Yeah. 
I tell you what, Tom, thank you so much. Thanks for taking the time. No problem. And, you know, I'm, on, on just a honest human to human level, you have been incredible to me and, and an inspiration and a guide. And you, you were the one who opened my world and voiceover uh, experience. And it, it taught me so much. Uh, what it taught me, probably the most powerful thing, is the human voice is very powerful. And when used properly, even when you're speaking in speeches, mm. not just in voiceover world, um, it, can, it can really change things. It can change, um, it can change lives. Oh, absolutely. And one quick tip, if you want that secret that you billboarded, you said Tom's going to talk about secrets to the voiceover world. I could tell you a few secrets. One that I think was important to me is when I was in radio, one of the things I learned was when you're on the air, you want to talk to people. You want to talk to them, not at them, not at them. So that's difficult for somebody that doesn't know how to relate to an audience they can't see because they're in a closed in studio, right? So what do you do? Well, I grabbed a little photograph and I put it up on the control board. Now I'm talking to that photograph over there. I'm talking to that person in that photograph. So I'm talking to them, not at them as a DJ. So that's one tip. Oh, I like that. You never gave that one to me before. Yeah. Like <laughs> you never asked. <laughs> so, Tom, thank you for being here. I love you dearly. Namaste. Namaste. Namaste, right. That's Namaste. it. That's my mat in front of my door. And, nice. <laughs> and, and nice, so I'm sorry. Nice meeting you, too, Nikki. Nice to meet you again, Tom. Yeah, I love your sense of humor, and I can't wait to hear more of it. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. I love yours, too. She's You're awesome. hilarious. She's awesome. Guys, I, I just want to make sure I do a uh, shout out to uh, the audience to, is it click on or to subscribe? I'm never really good with the technical experience. Yes, please subscribe. To Cat Span, not Cat Scan. And just in case any of you Span want to P. laugh, I put Cat Scan on almost all of the promotion. <laughs> it just seems right. But no, uh, please do subscribe because <laughs> we have a, a whole bunch. We've got about a month, uh, to, actually two months worth of people coming in and a lot of fun stuff in the future. And so we need as many of you to come in and listen and learn and have a little fun with us. And if you don't get to watch it as it's live, just subscribe and watch it later on when you can. The way you get all the information, you can go back to it, some things you missed. Ask your questions under the bottom, we'll still get back with you. Oh, that's right. Just make sure you subscribe. Yes, yeah, that's why I completely forgot. That's why you got me. Thank you. Wow. Hey, hey, even <laughs> I subscribed. I subscribed. <laughs> in it to win it. Okay. In it to win it. Hey, okay, listen, thank you guys for tuning in today. We love you. Mwah. Have an awesome Thanks, everybody. Thanks for joining us on Catspan. We had a blast, and we thank you for all your questions. Come hang with us next week. Same time, same station. Get stronger and stronger We're gonna dig deeper and deeper We play the game to win